comando da situação, mas você já está com comando aí. Boa tarde, gente. É, como o Arthur sinalizou, nós vamos para a nossa última conferência antes é, de finalizarmos o evento, com a, o avalia, encerramento e avaliação, com a fala, e eu estou super feliz de recebê-la em Belo Horizonte, né, já que eu sou cria é, do, do Helena de Poff, do, a, desse grupo, né, da, da FAI, etc. E, e Helena e eu nos conhecemos ano passado no Cairo, então estou super feliz de te receber aqui. Sorry for the Portuguese fine, introduction. Man. Uh, e Elina Martinovich, do University College da Inglaterra, falando sobre the reception of C.G. Jung in Death and Dying Studies in the United States. Ok? Ok. Um, hello, everybody, and thanks, Rodrigo, for the introduction, and thanks um, for inviting me here to speak and to close the conference. I try to speak slowly, so if also you have questions or you don't understand, you can also ask questions during the presentation. And then for the questions, I can understand Portuguese, it's just I cannot um, talk yet well. So um, This is initially a longer talk, so I will shorten it so that we will have time at the end for questions. But so the general idea of this talk today is to to present part of my research which is to write a history about the connections between death studies so in philosophy uh, literature or other related fields and psychotherapy and how these two fields became closely connected since the late 19th century, so the beginning of the professionalization also of psychology. And so the approach that I have is a sort of a mix of an intellectual history, looking at the history of ideas and protagonists, but more specifically, I want to understand how concepts related to death, dying, suicide, terminal illness, enter into psychotherapeutic practice and transform even concepts of psychotherapy. For example, finding a new way to treat depression or anxiety disorders, because as a therapist, you look into literature, philosophy, etc. So today I will just present one part of this research, and which is the specific aspect of the reception of Ziege Jung in uh, the American Death and Dying Studies, and in which I want to focus also on problems of transcultural questions in psychotherapy. So what happens when Americans read C.G. Jung at a specific moment of time? What does it tell us about the organization of psychotherapy and its therapeutic relationship with patients? There are many ways to look at the reception of C.G. Jung in um, U.S. death and dying studies, and I should probably start by defining what I understand as death and dying studies. So with this, I refer to uh, the rediscovery of death in, uh, among intellectuals in the 1960s, which was a global phenomenon, but which Michel Vauvel called the rediscovery of death because there were so many writings about attitudes towards death in sociology, anthropology, psychology. But more specifically, it refers to um, the psychologization of the experience of dying in the context of terminal illness um, care. And if you think of the book of Elizabeth Kübler-Ross, for example, which was published in 1969, and which popularized the idea that death can be described in terms of psychology. And so Jung, his impact can be studied in different ways, and I've just chosen three images to illustrate that. So one aspect would be to look at afterlife psychologies going back to 19th century, and this uh, idea of the subliminal self or psychical research that looks at death as a sort of a continuity or a transition between uh, different states of being rather than the end of a life, and which I have chosen here to 
represent with near-death studies which articulate um, this heritage of psychical uh, research. The second domain would be palliative care, in which normally we associate palliative care and psychology in relation to grief theory, which was an important impact in palliative care, for example, in Elisabeth Kübler's Ross. So the way how you deal with a fatal diagnostic and how you deal with your own anxieties and which is related to a theory about loss and separation. But there Jung comes into play because his concepts were articulated with grief theory saying that in the process of terminal illness there are, is a possibility of self-transformation or acceptance. And then a third field, there are other fields, but a third field would be um, the psychotherapeutic practice with psychedelic um, substances in which uh, Zege Jung's ideas were also introduced as a way to encounter anxieties and induce self-transformation. So again, like creating a, a cathartic moment in the process of approaching death. So here you see that ideas become embedded into practice and evolve into something new. And so, to shortly again come back to my initial point, so this is part of my project which looks at the intersection between humanistic traditions such as Michel Montaigne, but also in the more contemporary form, medical humanities, their interest for ars moriendi or the condition of dying and how it is articulated with psychiatry as a field of action, but also more broadly mental health, politics and psychotherapy. And so in my talk that I will try to rush through today, um, I will have these points. So I will first talk about Jung's Americanization um, and then about Jung's interest in death or what we could call also thanatology, the interdisciplinary study of death. And then I will look at four examples of his specific reception in death and dying studies. The first example is um, a text written by a psychiatrist who links Jung with William James, which was an important um, theoretical choice at the time. So I will explain that. And then the second example is psychedelics encounters with death. So in which the idea of the archetype and working with the unconscious becomes a tool to address anxieties of patients who are confronted with a terminal illness. And then the, first, the, the third example are suicide survivors and how they were studied in, um, uh, in a specific West Coast study um, that aimed at understanding um, what, what kind of impact had an attempted suicide on the individual in terms of attitudes to a dying. And then the last example are afterlife psychologies, the recent phenomena of near-death studies in which we can observe also the reactivation of Jung. So Jung's reception in the United States has been continuous since his first arrival in 1909. But it goes back also to the interactions he had since 1900, uh, 19, 1900 at the Burg Herzli, where he uh, worked in Zurich and where, we, where he had um, strong relationships with uh, important American patients who became also donors and which allowed to establish editorial uh, collaborations and translations. And one of the important momentum in his reception was uh, Beatrice Hinkel's translation of Psychology of the Unconscious in 1916. And we can talk about two important moments of the Americanization of Zege Jung, the first one being characterized by strong uh, relations between the protagonists in the American in America with Jung so like close um, relationship they knew him they made an analysis with him or related people um, and then the second which was important also for the establishment of the three institutes in um, New York Los Angeles and San Francisco and then we can call talk about 
to uh, simplify about the second momentum, which uh, is after World War II, when Zege Jung's idea became broadly embedded in not a Jungian context, but in the context of existential and positive psychologies. And so here I just give an example that, um, for example, Abraham Maslow in his book, Religions, Values, and Peak Experiences, highlights Jung's contribution for, I quote, liberating the notion of unconscious from Freud's theoretical framework and for allowing scholars to compare it to other fields of study, such as Zen Buddhism, end of quote. Another reception was um, within the theory of personality. So Jung was regarded, along with Carl Rogers, Carl Abraham, Gordon Alport, Kurt Goldstein, and Jean-Paul Sartre, as a, an important uh, protagonist in the field of personality studies, as it was argued in the book Self, The Self, Exploration and Personal Growth, published in 1956, and where Klaus Mustakas, the editor, introduced Jung as someone who continues to pre present unique ideas in, about personality. So here we have a context about social uh, theories ab about mental illness and looking more uh, precisely about not only uh, trying to contextualize the problem of mental health in a broader perspective, so social psychology and social explanation of mental disorders. You can think of Erich Fromm's sane society. So this is the concept, American cultural psychological concept that reactivates Jung rather through his work on personality. Um, than uh, his more uh, specific young on, uh, on archetypes or the unconscious. But this is then also part of a broader development um, which tried uh, to articulate the states, mental states of illness and mental health states on a continuum and to consider that mental illness can also be cured without pharmacology, that it can be cured in communities and that somehow um, schizophrenia can have uh, social origins or origins in a miscommunication. I've just chosen one uh, painting by Adolf Wölfi, who's an Art Brut artist and who just um, can emblematically represent also Jung's interest in the pro creative processes of self-transformation. But so to um, conclude this first part is that the post-World War II opened questions on the relationship between sanity and sanity, which of course would then increase with the deinstitutionalization de of psychiatry and the politics of experience, to quote R.D. Lang, but also the relationship between medicine and spirituality, especially with the new developments in biomedicine, if you think of brain death, etc., which then also had to re-articulate the conditions of living and dying, like what happens to the patients in the hospital and what can psychology contribute to this debate. And so to go into Jung's work on death, so he has written um, several works on um, death, so it's uh, considerations about the soul and afterlife. It has been, a, um, he has often expressed an interest in death and life through oriental philosophies. For example, um, when he did a preface to the secret of the golden flower, that is a Taoist text and which has been uh, translated and commented by Richard Wilhelm. Or then um, another commentary that he made was the Tibetan Book of the Dead and which I will uh, mention later on. But we can distinct, distinguish between different approaches, on the one hand doing commentary on a tradition of non-Western philosophies about dying, and second, a tradition of his own conceptions about death, which represents a sort of a cosmology or theology of dying, as Sono Shandazani was arguing, because he relates, uh, he recounts his dreams uh, with the encounter of death and how he deals with the problem of ancestry and identity also arguing that there are 
that life is and death is just a transition in a life. And then a third aspect, which is Jung's his own experience with nearly dying when he suffered from a heart attack in 1945, and which he reflected on in Memories, Dreams and Reflection, published in 1961, and immediately translated into English in 1962. But the most important reception of Jung in relation to death and dying studies in the United States has been, as I said, on the one hand, his autobiography uh, in which he talks about his noetic experience of almost dying, and then his commentary uh, about the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which was um, compiled and commented by Walter Evans Wentz in 1927, and which has known several editions, so 1947 and 1957. What is interesting is that uh, Jung's commentary which was initially published in German, in an a German edition of the Tibetan Book of the Dead in 1935, was then included in the 1957 edition of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, in which Jung is presented as the authoritative voice to give a psychological interpretation of this guidebook that is a guide to the dead who um, continue to live on in a transitional state of the bardo for 49 um, days. And so there he makes a distinction uh, between the different three states that are traditionally associated with the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and which is the Chi Chi Bardo, so what he calls the psychic happenings at the moment of death, and then the Kunid Bardo, which are the karmic illusions and the dream states, as he calls them, and which is reported in the Tibetan Book of the Dead as an encounter and visualization of deities, positive or negative encounters. And then the third aspect is the Sitpa Bardo, which he refers to birth instinct, but also potentially self-transformation, thinking that psychotherapy is actually the place where the Sitpa Parto can be um, integrated. So it's this psychologization of a travel of the dead from another culture that he introduces into a um, Western psychological conception of dying. And the broader context of this is, of course, that through this English integration of uh, Jung's commentary in 1957, a lot of cultural interest also um, picked up Jung's ideas through this new edition of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So you have um, this adaptation by the psychedelic practitioners such as Timothy Leary, Ralph Metzner, and Richard Albert, who made a reinterpretation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead in the form of the psychedelic experience, a manual by, based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead in 1964. And they make this difference between the first phase as a period of ego loss, so you have again this reference to psychological concepts, looking then at the second bardo as a period of hallucinations, which can have a, a value, also a noetic value, that can transform the um, the personality, and then the third aspect would be a period of re-entry. So it's like re-entering the body with a new conception about life and death. Thanks. And the difference is, of course, that this manual puts a lot more emphasis on experimentation. You have to experiment in groups and follow certain protocols, and a lot is emphasized um, um, about the visual hallucinations. As they cite here, you're witnessing the magical dance of forms, the ceaseless play of elements, earth, water, air, fire, in ever-changing forms of manifestation. Do not become attached to any vision or revelation because you need to go back and to re-entry and kind of change um, your mind through this experience. So there are different ways of looking at the Tibetan Book of Death, and I've just shown you two, but the important thing is that they learn about the Tibetan Book of Dead through the lenses of, um, of Jung, who has already accredited a psychological interpretation to it.
And what is interesting now is that another uh, field in which uh, Jung's text became important was this growing interdisciplinary intellectual collaboration of anthropologists, medical practitioners, which called themselves increasingly thanatology, especially since it became institutionalized in 1969 in the form of an international association. And so here in the publication of The Meaning of Death, which was edited by Hermann Feifel, who was an important thanatologist at the time, they introduced also Jung's text about Seele und Tod, the soul and death, and which in fact was the first English translation of this text. So it appeared in the context of thanatology, a scholarly endeavor to contextualize um, Jung along Paul Thielich, Herbert Marcuse, and others. So we have seen existential psychology, his interest, the interest in personality concepts, then Tibetan uh, book and its reception, and here we have another one, which is thanatology. And so to put this in a broader context, so this interest in death in the 1960s, as I mentioned before, um, was this idea shared by a lot of intellectuals that there is a overgrowing denial of death among the Western population due to the many advances in biomedicine, like life-sustaining or life-prolonging techniques, reanimation of patients who previously were declared dead, the definition of brain death, which allowed to do organ transplantations, but which caused a lot of incertitudes about who is living, who is dying, who has the duty to offer organs who doesn't have the duty. So a lot of bioethical questions there. And so the, this humanistic tradition, but also psychological tradition such as Jung, offered um, some input to talk about these taboo topics. And of course, Freud was very big with his denial of death, which he formulated in Thoughts on War and Death in 1915. But Jung became increasingly important because it allowed to talk about the process of dying in terms of self-transformation rather in ter as in terms of regression or something that is a collective problem. Um, so I think I'll move on, but I, what I wanted to show here is just that the broader context of the psychologization of that death, which I was mentioning at the beginning, and um, which was not just a history of ideas or, a, or a history of hopes, it was really embedded in the everyday pra psychotherapeutic practice, as we see here with um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross death and dying seminars um, that she held together with a pastoral caretaker at the Billings Hospital between 1965 and 69. And how this worked, in fact, is that the viewers who were practitioners, so nurses, social workers, medical practitioners, uh, were watching the interview that Karl Neisswanger did with the patients, in this case, a 23-year-old who suffered from leukemia. And the idea was that the practitioners, but also the general public that was invited to assist these lessons could learn something about the anticipation of death. So the consider consideration of the dying patient as a teacher. And then working through this idea of denial and acceptance, as we have seen here in the case of Kübler-Ross, so the, the idea that there are psychological stages in the process of grief and separation, that it can also refer differently to the ideas of denial of death, as formulated by Freud, connected with more um, positive uh, psychology, so considering that the acceptance has something to do with peak experiences or something that is self-transformative. So Jung's study on death and the US, we can see that um, his reception has happened at the intersection of Ars Moriendi and Thanatology. I haven't commented the preface and the commentaries about the Tibetan Book of the Dead, but it shows that this was the major connection that was made. He can help us understand or gain another perspective about death and the general interest in Oriental philosophies. 
but then also the context of conceiving dying as a transformational state and a process rather than just the end of something. And so to come to the first example, I've picked this example um, by Russell Noyes, who was an ordinary psychiatrist, very well published more than 300 articles, and he did uh, psychosomatic medicine, medical humanities, different approaches, but he did one text in which he um, talked about dying and mystical consciousness, and that was published in 1971, and in which he explains the dying experience as a noetic and emotional experience that can tell us um, something about um, not only the patient, but more globally about how we can talk to patients who experience a profound, uh, uh, or who approach death. And so in this, in this article, he refers on the one hand to Jung's autobiography, in which he narrates how he, um, how he survived the cardiac uh, arrest. And he, in fact, says a number of things. He traveled uh, uh, around different places, and he, uh, he, he encountered different archetypes. And so he just picked the aspects that allowed him to link this narrative to William James and who talked about um, uh, the mystical states of consciousness in his 1902 lectures on mysticism in the varieties of religious experience. But it's this idea that a state close to death, and more specifically, if a person is threatened by death, for example, in an accident, or if uh, you are nearly drowning, or an attempted suicide, that you might have these characteristics which are ineffability, the difficulty to talk about, transcendence of time, not so that's time contraction on the one hand and time extension on the other hand. And then the noetic aspect, the sense of truth, you know that you, what you have seen is not subjective, it's like an objective truth, something that is, has been revealed to you that you haven't known before and you wouldn't know after that. And then there is the loss of control that you cannot actually act. You just can accept that this happens. And then Russell Noyes adds these emotional extremes because he was interested also in this articulation of anxiety and um, protection of trauma. But so here you see a re-articulation of William James' ideas of mystical consciousness with the help of a self-report um, by uh, Jung. How much time do I have left? Ah, oh, 15, okay. So I've, I've just picked this one image um, to make the link between, so William James and Jung and near-death experiences. And then the study of um, hallucination and psychophysiology that was increasingly interested from the 1960s on in what they call to study the experimental mysticism. So like studying meditation, but also especially hallucination, and in which we see frequently um, mystical elements that show up and that make a reference to William James, such as Teresa of Avila or Samadhi. Interestingly, Teresa of Avila is a person and the samadhi is a state, but it's often compared as two extremes on a range of uh, uh, hypo-arousal and hyper-arousal. So what is excitation and what is a lack of excitation? To the right, meditative states, and to the left, ecstatic rapture. And so it's like considering de death and the dying process also between these extremes of mystical states. And so again, another quote by Jung um, when he writes the, the foreword to Suzuki's um, Zen Buddhism, in which he also formulates this psychological ap approach to Zen Buddhism, where he says that Zen-like consciousness is linked by Jung to the idea of losing ego boundaries. Satori is interpreted and formulated as a breakthrough of a consciousness limited to the ego form in the for form of the non-ego-like self. So the frequent reference to consciousness, but then including um, the problem of the ego and how you gain control or lose control in uh, moments of meditation or potentially near-death states. 
And so to conclude with this first example um, that I've very quickly summarized is that if we look at Jung's reception in death and dying studies, we have to read his reception in accordance with uh, William James' uh, reception. Because his mysticism was understood at the time increasingly as a type of altered states of consciousness and a possible link to understand consciousness in different traditions such as oriental philosophies and practices, which then allowed to link it also to the problem of nearly dying as potentially transformative through this link of consciousness. And then the second example are psychedelic encounters with death, and which I will present now is just the, the second development of psychedelic therapies, because in the beginning, when um, LSD, for instance, was introduced in the early 1950s, it was considered as a psychotomimetic, so a substance that can mimic mental illness. But increasingly from the mid-1950s mid on, it was considered as a mind-altering or mind-expanding substance so that allowed to unfold material of the inner lives and especially um, to reveal the unconscious as this has been done in the approach of psycholytic um, therapy, for example. And Ronald Sanderson, who was a British psychotherapist, was influenced by uh, Tege Jung, and he said that LSD allows to unfold the unconscious and to work through um, potential states of rebirth to make, uh, to make elements from uh, the psychic life, even beyond life, to come to bring it to the surface and to work through it. So it's in, in this context of psycholytic therapy that puts emphasis on creative aspects and unfolding the unconscious that Tsege Jung's idea of the archetype um, became suddenly um, relevant. And also the question like how can you compare um, individuals that have a psychedelic experience, why do they experience sometimes the same images, like the, uh, the archetypes as they revealed of the mother or the shadow. And so it's this whole new field that evolved out of the use of the substance to, um, to unfold the unconscious or creative processes. And what is important to remember in this history of psychotropic substance use in clinical experiments that has now been quite well studied already is that one of the last uh, fields of developments was the use of LSD for cancer patients. And it started as a plan to, to work on the perceptions of pain uh, in cancer patients because the idea was that LSD is potentially potent powerful so it might alter the psychological perception of pain. So it was an idea based on Thomas Sass, pain and pleasure. So what is your potential, what is the potential of drugs to alter your body perception? If you lose the perception of time and space and body, maybe when you come back, you can reduce your um, pain. And in fact, this one study that was conducted in Chicago in 1964 showed that to some extent it reduced pain, but it was only conducted on a series of patients over the period of 21 days. But where Jung really came uh, most into focus was the therapy developed by Stanislav Grof and his collaborators, and in particular his wife, Joan Halifax, which is here on one of the photos, and who developed um, psychedelic therapies, what they called uh, the human encounter with death. So they wanted to provoke um, uh, a state of catharsis mimicking death through the substance. And how did they do it? they considered the psychotherapeutic work as going through different layers of uh, core experiences, what they called it, inducing as the most extreme version um, the perinatal experiences, going back to um, pre-uterine experiences, because they thought that the most the uh, anxiety comes, even the anxiety of, or fear of death comes from this traumatic moment of having or of of coming into the world and being separated by the womb, and that 
dealing with any sort of depression, anxiety has to go back to this pre-uterine state, which was a reference to Rank and his trauma of birth. Uh, trauma of birth. And so they had a series of concepts um, that they uh, conducted during these psychotherapeutic sessions and which was to look at the aesthetic experience but also psychodynamic elements that come up and in, in, in the end also articulate transpersonal aspects, which refers to a whole series of other approaches that um, make a link between transpersonal psychology and William James again as you see here in um, Masters and Houston's example of varieties of um, uh, experience that is a combination of Groff, which was later on, but also William James. And so it put a lot of emphasis on drawings and articulating the images that come out through the psychotherapeutic process in terms of archetypes. And so, in this case, we can see that Groff's um, work has to be considered in relation to transpersonal psychology, something that was not considered at the time as necessarily controversial. It was part of humanistic psychology. It evolved, in fact, out of humanistic psychology in 1971. And it refers to Jung's idea and problem of überpersönlich, so the equivalent of collective uh, unconscious, so how can you gain something beyond psychology, beyond Freud, etc. You go into this transpersonal um, psychology. The fourth example that I will also make um, a short one is um, one example of a post-Jungian uh, therapist who is still alive, um, David Rosen, who did a study in the early 1970s with, with Richard Seiden, um, where he interviewed um, six survivors out of the eight survivors who attempted suicide on the Golden Gate Bridge or on the Oakland Bay Bridge. And they published two papers about it. And what they were interested in was not how to prevent suicide or, or what makes patients being suicidal, but rather what had what kind of impact had the experience of almost dying but not dying on a person that was previously mentally unstable. And so they conclude that in some cases, there were only six cases, so it's a bit difficult, and two of the six cases took some LSD when they were uh, doing their attempt at suicide, but they concluded that they had, in fact, a sort of a cathartic or transformative experiences, two of them becoming also religious once they hit um, the water. But so I just wanted to show this example because it connects to the broader development of suicide studies, which since the 1960s looked more into understanding the experiences of attempting suicide rather than uh, preventing suicide, and that go, uh, again, relate to this um, experiential realm uh, that, is, uh, that surrounds studies um, interested in death. This is one of the survivors that was interviewed at the time. And where you see propositions about an experience of dying in mortal danger that connect somehow to the stages that we have seen in Kubler-Ross and which, which also connect somehow to Walter Cannon and later on stress studies, like that there is a certain resistance and struggle in the first part of an attempted suicide or uh, nearly uh, near-death experience, and that in this moment of a struggle, there is this imagery or moments significant of a person's life that come back and that can be treated or revealed in the psychotherapeutic that psychotherapeutic process, which can then lead to acceptance or transcendence. So there are phenomenological approaches of the dying experiences that connect theories of grief, transpersonal approaches to dying, um, and uh, epidemiological studies of investigating experiences of survivors, which then became challenged and transformed into psychotherapy, for example, in the case of um, David Rosen, who was the investigator of the suicide studies, who then wrote a book in the 1990s 
called Transforming Depression, in which he formulated this idea that every patient that is depressed in his practice, he visualizes ego side, what he calls the annihilation of personality, so killing the self or killing the old self, as Fritz uh, Perls was also saying in his sessions, like eat, kill, and eat your old self to be able to gain a new self. And so um, there is this sort of new therapeutic paradigm on depression that has evolved out of thanatology studies of survivors that I wanted to show. And so I think I have two minutes left, but there are other fields and that show like how um, the parapsychological aspect of Jung's work come into account in, uh, in the case of near-death experiences scholars, some of them being here, most of them actually being at Virginia University Charlottesville, which has an institute for parapsychology and where they study uh, Jungian concepts um, in relation to uh, survivors of near-death experiences. So I think I will conclude with that. Where, for example, the archetype of death and enlightenment is proposed by Grosso, who does a transcultural exploration of different um, dying processes that he then articulates in relation to Jung. And he says there is like an individuation process in the moment of approaching death. But so to come to the conclusion is that um, we can see from a focus, or I think that we can see from a focus directed onto Jung and his reception in death and dying studies, that we have to, to do a, an intellectual study that considers Jung and James together, and that we can see that how psychology of religion shifts towards a transpersonal psychology via the Tibetan Book of the Dead and altered states of consciousness, experimental studies and meditation. And that theories of consciousness is proposed based on experiments rather than based on theory. And that Eastern philosophies are read through the lenses of Western scholars to bring in concepts that help to understand the dying process. And that the positive psychologies can be a counter model to psychopharmacologies. And then the preparation of death, so Ars Moriendi, a long-standing idea that is presented in psychology as a continuous learning process, as we have seen in the case of Kübler-Hoss. And then a last aspect, which I don't have time to talk about, but there is a very interesting articulation between trauma theory and personality theory that was also developed at the time, and that gives something like this, like how do spiritualist approaches in biomedicine relate to studies of survivors, because in the end it's also about survivors and how do we learn and how do we interpret the lives of survivors. I also don't have time for this, but I recommend this reading, <laughs> Poems by Gregory Corso, The Happy Birthday of Death, to put um, the American context of death studies in a, in a broader uh, scope. just a little bit in Portuguese. É, a gente temos aí 5, 10 minutos para perguntas para Milena. Alguém gostaria? Questions? Elena, thank you. I think last time we were together, I probably said the same thing. At the beginning of the talk, I feel like you're talking about my life. I went to Harvard right after Timothy Leary left. Yeah. I lived with Jungians who were taking lots of drugs. And then after that, went to California where a lot of the same people were and the Salem Institute and other places. And I don't remember the drugs so much there as uh, the communal lifestyles and uh, 
And then, of course, at one point, AIDS hits. So dying becomes a big thing. But what I remember about before AIDS was the criticism that those of us who were enthusiastic about mystical psychoanalysis of Jung would receive from the more uh, uh, sober Freudian or eclectic psychoanalysts. They said, you'll leave it because Jung is for the old, not for the young. And it, it made some sense because it's about mysticism, it's about accepting religion to some extent, certainly more than Freud did. Whereas Freud, the, Freudian, the Freudians have all these requirements of the youth to develop, right? And this Jung takes out. So um, I uh, just am going through this the way I remember it. Actually, my roommate, my college roommate, ends up going back to Southern California and being with Timothy Leary when he died there. And then, oddly, my roommate got cancer and died within a few years himself. But um, I've been connected to this, uh, this business my whole life by my interests and my earlier life by some experiences, too. And I wonder what you thought about this. The way we solved it is we said, well, we're old souls. And that, you know, there's a help in Eastern mysticism about finding out who is an old soul and not an old soul. Um, does any of this make any sense to you? Yeah. yeah, I think that's a very, very interesting thought with youth and old age. I didn't think yet about this in such a way. And um, I think there are several things. If, if you go into the philosophical tradition and classic ideas, which were retaken by Michel Montaigne and the humanist tradition, then you see that it's not about age, really, because it's already almost when you're born, you should think about death every day, and you should train yourself and um, to anticipate uh, your own end in a way and he so uh, so I think uh, yeah and he had his own horse accident and after which he thought that he wasn't really fearing death anymore but um, I think that's that's a very interesting question actually when becomes the training of death or ars moriendi associated to the problem of youth or age I think that would be good to be able to situate that and what this means for the general dispute between uh, Freudians and Jungians. Interestingly, in the case of Jungians, well, or post-Jungians, they really go back to childhood and pre-childhood, so in a way it is somehow compensating what they think, it's compensating the regressive part of um, of Freudian approach and focusing on um, trauma moments of an infant's life rather than looking at something that disqualifies life as the most important moment of a l life. So because if you go back to before you were born, then life is, has another perspective in the theory of where the boundaries of death and life are put. So I think although the criticism makes totally sense from a Freudian perspective, you could also argue that it's the opposite. It's, it negates somehow um, the importance of life because it brings back another dimension. But it made me think that the problem of at what age should you meditate <laughs> about it and that this is a very good point. Thank you. Made me think of things. Um. <coughs> Another kind of reflection. Uh, I think you have a different, after all, uh, we can make some reflections about these versions of death. Uh, I think you, this Jungian heritage is a kind of version, very interesting. And uh, perhaps you have another version. Uh, for instance, 
the, kind, the, the, the question of cryogeny. Uh, mm. and there are some authors connected to these uh, studies of the uh, brain subject. For, for instance, here in Brazil, uh, Francisco Ortega, uh, in, in Spain mm. or Argentina, Fernando Vidal, all these authors are very interesting because uh, they show that this, uh, this uh, strong connection between mind and, and brain or psychological life and brain or mm -hmm. brain and subjectivation mm -hmm. uh, conducts to some practice of death. Mm -hmm. For instance, cryogeny, mm -hmm. then you can be uh, prepared to be, mm -hmm. uh, to be returned to life entirely or only with your head. Supposing mm -hmm. that our, uh, uh, your main identity mm -hmm. is on the brain. Then uh, it's interesting because uh, both versions of, her, or, of death, and we can mention uh, some others that we can find in different uh, human groups and different cultures, it inspired a lot of uh, movies. Um, I think Hollywood is, uh, you, in Hollywood you can find both versions, for example, Vanilla Sky by one side, with so much connected to cryogeny, and, and by the other side you have a lot of pictures with this experience to be very connected to the limit, the experience of the tunnel of light, you have a lot of uh, experience. Uh, a, lo a lot of movies also connect with this. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, don't you think that this different versions of death, in some sense, don't produce us? this effect in our uh, culture, how to be prepared, or wh what's to death? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that is so uh, strongly connected with this so interesting book, sometimes forgotten, uh, wrote by Philippe Arriès. Uh, the, s the history of death. Yeah. Yeah, in the Occident. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I mean, that's not exactly in my scope because um, I'm more focusing on on psychotherapy, but but definitely the the de developments in transhumanism uh, are important and cryogenization and that alter. Uh, our cultural approach of not only death but also how we anticipate the continuation of the death because in the end it's about problems of identity and ancestry and definition of humanhood and where does it stop and where does it end and um, I think even it has to do also with recent developments in genetic biobanks and this idea that you uh, start to make provisions and prevention on a self in a self-centered way based on genetic information that you predict and you correlate you know risks and aspects of your life in the new near or in the long future so i think that uh, i would see this also in, in in that connection of what is the what is selfhood in the age of um, genetic biobanks. But definitely the Vidal book and Ortega book is very interesting because they make this connection with uh, brain death also and uh, what does it mean for a personhood like uh, that, you know, the, you define death being located in the brain and so how do you, um, how is this articulated then in medicine and general culture? So definitely it's it's really important. Mais alguém? So. Linda Helena, uh, how is, you can observe, you are uh, our median, our Congress is dying also. <laughs> what? <laughs> the, uh, in the process of death, because yeah. it, is, it is in the end, uh, somebody has to come back home, you have Easter beginning, then yeah. you have this situation. But I have to say that it, uh, it's very important to have your, uh, your presence here uh, 
because uh, in this effort to uh, make connections between our research and uh, some research made by some uh, fellows in different countries, it's uh, very important to, uh, to, to be put in contact with some questions like you, uh, you presented here. And I th I'm uh, very glad to have your presence. And I think your question is very important. Uh, one thing that's uh, crucial to say here, uh, I'm going to change to Portuguese. Uh, Jelena participou de um encontro sobre uh, a questão das terapias em diferentes culturas que houve na Fiocruz no ano passado. E foi um trabalho super importante. Como ela já estaria aqui, trazida pela Cristiana Facnet, eu achei que era super importante a gente também trazer essa conexão com esse trabalho dela, que é super rico. E tentei também trazer para cá o, o Mariano Rupertos, que fez, inclusive, a mesa com ela. Lá. Então, esse é um trabalho super importante. Então, dentro desses esforços de conexão entre os nossos GTs e também outras uh, linhas históricas, esse trabalho dela eu vejo como assim, um dos mais interessantes. Então, quem sabe a gente consegue abrir uma linha aí de, de contribuições mais adiante. Tá? Oh. Thanks for inviting me again. It's really a pleasure to be here. Although I missed most of the Congress and I have to apologize, but it was not possible to come earlier. Diante disso, eu só tenho a agradecer. Nós só fomos para Helena. Muitíssimo obrigado. Thank you very, very much. Sérgio, você é da, co da comissão local, o que, que você quer fazer? <risos>